Uh, today's uh, sermon is entitled, Sometimes We Must March All Night to See God Do More Than We Expect or Imagine. And today's scripture is from Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 27. And we will be reading them together, starting as soon. As soon as Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai, and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, sent Hoham, king of Hebron, to Parim, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lashish, and the Derir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, and the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against him. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and help, of, and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the city hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people who were with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear for, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them in a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haram, and struck them as far as Ezekah and Makadah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haron, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven, and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp at Gilgal. These five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave of Makeda. And it was told to Joshua, The five kings have been found hidden in the cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. But do not slay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies. Attack their rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. When Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished striking them with a great blow until they were wiped out, and when the remnant that had remained of them had entered into the fortified cities, then all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Megiddo. Not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. Then Joshua said, 
Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jahu, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous. For thus the Lord will do to you against whom you fight. And afterward Joshua struck them and put them to death. And he hanged them on five trees. And they hung on the trees until evening. But at the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded, and they took them off from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hid themselves. And they set large stones against the mouth of the cave, which remained to this very day. And Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Father, the Bible tells us that um, in Isaiah chapter 40, I believe it's verse 11, and in Hebrews, that you come in the volume of the book. And we pray that as we open your book, your word, that you would come to us, reveal yourself to us, reveal what you are like. Obviously, it's a mirror. And you're going to show us what we're like. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, work in us to glorify yourself transform us so that we can release more of ourselves to be uh, like Jesus, Father. We ask you in, in your name, we pray. All God's people said. Hey, we're going to look at uh, some pretty interesting things in Scripture today. First thing we're going to look at is how this unholy alliance of five kings who are going to gang up against Gibeon. Because, I'm sorry, yeah, they're going to gang up on Gibeon because Gibeon made a covenant with God's people. They're actually led by a guy who has a very biblical sounding name, Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem. The second thing we're going to look at is how Gideon, Gibeon calls on Israel to intervene, and Israel actually, actually intervenes by marching all night, and how that's a reflection of our lives in Christ sometimes. Sometimes it feels like we're pulling all-nighters, and just when you want to take a break, you find there's more to do. But God comes true. The second thing we're going to look at is how Joshua prayed. And, he's, and he, uh, he prays and God makes the sun and the moon stand still, which really he's making time stand still. I found a bunch of cool things about um, astronomy and the astrological nature of the universe and how these things possibly could happen. But the, 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 the greatest scientists say, you know what? It's God stopped time. We, we have our theories, but the truth of the matter is God stopped time. Didn't stop everything from spinning, but somehow he stopped time. Joshua, uh, the fourth thing we're going to look at is in Joshua 10, 19 through uh, 24, how Israel puts their foot on the neck of the five kings. And that's a metaphor for what God calls us commoners to do to take on the kings of the earth sometimes. And the fourth thing, fifth thing we're going to look at is how God does far more abundantly than all we can ever do or, or dream, think, or ask. So does it feel like, especially this time of year when we have even more to do, there's more people to visit and there's shopping and whatnot. You ever feel like you've, you've pulled an all-nighter and you're just exhausted? I did that once in college, so I did it more than once. And I remember one time falling asleep during an exam. <laughs> I thought, boy, <laughs> that's not a real great thing to do today. I should have gone to bed. <laughs> but here we are. We're, think of all the activities that we're engaged in. I mean, some of us have actually been called and all these activities that we're engaged in, we're, we're doing them. It could be work, it could be our hobbies. But while we're doing them, we are interested and fervent for the souls of people around us. So here we are, we're doing all the things that other people do, and then we have this additional 
spiritual burden for the souls, for the people who are around us. We're always looking for divine opportunities. And on top of everything else, you can say, gosh, this happened to me this week. I'm like, gosh, Lord, I got to pray for so-and-so. I need to pray for so-and-so. Now, I don't have to pursue these godly burdens in an ungodly way. I don't have to pursue them in a, in a, in a uh, what do you call it, type A carnal way. I have to relax in the Lord and say, okay, God, thank you for bringing that person to my mind. And I'm going to pray. Sometimes the phone rings and it interrupts your prayer time. But what does God do? What, why, 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 are, why are we challenged the way we're challenged? It's because God is calling us to do what Israel did. March all night and go and save my covenant people. And Gibeon is now part of the covenant people. Israel marches all night. Maybe they thought, hey, this is cool. We'll have a rest in the morning. But what, what has happened is Gilgal, I mean, Gibeon is a fortified city. And those five armies... They estimate there's about 330,000 men on the battlefield. They have surrounded that city. They can't get into it. So they're probably in the woods, chopping trees, trying, they're going to, they're going to make some bear, they're going to make some uh, um, battering rams. And if they haven't brought them with them, they're going to, they're, they're preparing to, to figure out a way to take down the walls of the city. And Israel comes through the woods and realizes, oh my gosh, the armies have their backs to us. We can't take a break. Let's attack them now. So just at the point of exhaustion where you want to take a break, you come upon the enemy and God, that's what happens with us, right? You're going to bed at night and you get this burden to pray for someone. And just when you want to take a break, the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and says, no, pray for this person. Because the, God has the enemy surprised and he is going to work in that person's life. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 10 here. We're going to see that God goes to work at the point of our exhaustion. He's actually working before then too. But don't think just because we're tired that God is not working. Sometimes the challenges that we face are from the people who should be on our side. And they position themselves to be on our side. They call themselves Christians. Let's go on to our next slide. Adonai Zedek. His name literally means the king of righteousness or the lord of righteousness. On top of all the things we face, we have discovered that there are a lot of people in America calling themselves Christians who are not Christians at all. And as good-natured and as helpful as they may want to be to us, they can't really help us. God is actually calling on us to not associate with and sometimes to even attack the people who call themselves by God's name and may be positioning themselves to be in the places where God is supposed to be, like Jerusalem, and they are totally against the Lord. And that's been the downfall of our beloved USA. We have people who have infiltrated, we have, we, have, we have Adonai Zedex who have infiltrated every stratum of the American government, positioning themselves as righteous people, saying, well, I'm like you. And we, we look at all their policies and we realize that those who are called by religious names may not be at all biblical in their behaviors. We're going to put our foot on the neck of the Adonai Zedex if America is to survive. In Revelation 11, 8, there are two prophets who lay dead in the street of Jerusalem. You know what Jerusalem is called in Revelation 11, 8? It's called the city that is metaphorically known as Sodom and Egypt. Abomination, and that which stands against the plan of God, Sodom and Egypt. And how do you know it's Jerusalem? Because there's a hyphen in that, in that passage of scripture and it says, where the Lord is also, was also crucified. So Satan's plan is to, take is to take Jerusalem in the latter days and make it Sodom central. 
People who have visited Jerusalem tell me there, wherever you go in the city, there are people carrying signs for homosexual rights. We got Adonai Zedex positioning themselves as righteous people in Jerusalem. You know, do not be fooled by all these people running around the world with Jewish names. The Bible literally in Revelation says, those who call themselves Jews, but they are not. And these people, if you trace their histories, they are neither Jews ethic, uh, eth uh, ethnically, biologically, and they're not Jews by participating in the covenant of God. In Genesis 13.10, as Abraham and Lot are splitting, separating, Lot looks down at the community of Sodom and Gomorrah and he goes, wow, the lights are on in that bright city. It looks like something's happening there. And the Bible says this. He lifted up, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. And there's a parenthetical element. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels are going to put their foot on the neck of this wonderful looking place that seems like it should be like, you know, a godly place, but it's not. Only what the Bible speaks of is reliable or can assure us of what is godly. And that's why when people ask me now, well, what are you? I say, I'm a Bible guy. Because there are a lot of people running around calling themselves Christians. And they don't worship God. They don't worship the God of the Bible. They worship everything else. And because so, so, so many people don't read the Bible properly. They, they approach the Bible with their own pet doctrines in mind their own ideas about God, and they try to ascribe them upon Scripture, and when something in Scripture doesn't match that, they just go on to another Scripture. Or they bounce around the Scriptures. The purveyors of false religion, the Adonai Zedex, they should be like Gibeon. Just put yourself under God's covenant. Get right with God. Let's move on. So Gibeon calls on Israel to intervene, and Israel does. It gets up and marches all night. Does that seem fair? They just, we just saw uh, last week, right, how they made this treaty. No, not by the, under the best of circumstances, but it's, it's going to be honored on both parties. And so here's the, the first thing that Israel has to do in this new covenant relationship with these people that haven't proven themselves yet is they have to march all night to help them. You got any relationships? I know some of them, we have children. We'd get up, uh, my grandkids, I'd march all night for my grandkids. But sometimes God is asking us to get up and march all night for other people who are part of his covenant, they're on his covenant team, but they haven't proven themselves yet. So Gibeon says to Israel, do not relax your hand. That, you know what that word means? It means don't abandon us in our time of need. So Israel marches all night. And you know what the word march, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. The word march actually means to go up. They're walking uphill. 25 miles, force march. It says the word march means they ascended and climbed. Burning with fervor. I believe that they were anointed by the Holy Spirit to make that trek. Got those feelings? Let's move on. So Joshua and Israel are assured of victory. God says, don't worry about this. I've given them into your hand. It's kind of cool. Gibeon kind of comes back door and makes a covenant with Israel. And the, what God is going to do is he's going to use that as the, as the opportunity to gather all the people that Israel needs to destroy in one place at least in, the, in the, the southern part of the kingdom or the territory where they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're about to attack. Don't have to go city to city. Don't have to knock down their walls. No more, no more going around Jericho's. No more hiding behind and, and getting them to chase you and sl slipping into the AIs. God goes, I'm going to bring those jokers out on, all out at one time for you. Now, if you're thinking, 
humanistically, rationally, you would go, oh my gosh. This is why God told Israel not to be afraid. There's five armies out there. What am I going to do? And God is like, those armies aren't there to terrorize you. Those armies are there so I can gather them all up in one place and crack them like eggshells for you. So here we are. We face this every, all the time as the people of God. Our challenges seem overwhelming. The more you know, the more intimidated you could be. When you realize, literally, every stratum of the American government has been infiltrated by Adonai Zedex. It's not just the American government. No, it's not just the American government. It's all over the world. Right, New York City, the U.S. Amen. And but, but what is God doing? Why does he give us this information? Is it so we can sit on our hands? No. Do nothing with it? Should we say, well, you know, our church isn't a thousand people, so, you know, what can we do? What encouraged me a few years ago was God showed me, you don't need a broad coalition. You need a faithful remnant. I whittled down Gideon's army from 18,000 to 300. When I was reading that as a young Christian, I was in the military, I was, got, just got saved, I was reading that, I'm like, no! <laughs> we need these numbers! <laughs> and God says, I've never worked that way. I work through a faithful remnant. Now, I have been in meetings with people who call themselves by God's name, and they are not biblically Christ biblical Christians. They, they serve the Mormon church, the Catholic church, and they, and, they, and they have literally said on our phone calls, well, we're the remnant. I'm thinking to myself, no, nah, you're not the remnant. But everybody thinks they're the remnant. So Israel is going to... God assures them a victory, but if you don't anticipate the tr that God is telling you the truth, do you think you would march all night and get there? If you didn't think God was telling you the truth, would you march all night and go there? The phone rings. Someone's really upset about something or somebody's being evil. Or someone is just wanting to you know, pour their burdens out on you. Those people are not our issue. Those people are not the focus of our attention. The chief aim of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So when all these situations come up, we say, Lord, how do I glorify you in this situation? This is this. I just only started thinking about this this week. This is changing my my Christian walk here. It's no longer about, um, hey, I read the Bible. I was on the phone. The guy asked me a question. Sometimes they ask you the right question. It leads you to the right answer. If you don't get the right question, you don't get the answer. You don't think about it. A guy says to me, I said to this guy, listen, don't read the Bible and say, wow, how can this scripture make me something? Read the Bible and say, wow, how can this scripture work inside me so I glorify God? So the issue isn't me. The issue really isn't the other person. The issue is, Lord, this situation seems very tenuous, it seems very dark, it seems very unwinnable, but Lord, I want to glorify you in the midst of this situation. If you don't anticipate that God's going to get glory out of it, or going to work, why would you walk all night? That's what Israel does, though. All right? Now, God says, I'm going to give them into your hand. If somebody's going to get into my hand, they've got to be at the end of my arm. They can't be two miles away. I got to be willing to belt, belly up to the counter and okay. <laughs> you got to be present. You got to show up. We did a conference out in Ohio. And that was our theme. Show up. Be accounted. Your hands must be open to receive what God gives you. If you don't anticipate God's telling the truth, you won't open your hand. Though promised victory, sometimes you got to move quickly. And it, it, that's an indication that you have faith, that you anticipate that God is going to provide a providential positive outcome for, for us, or for, you know, for his will, really. Got those? Let's move on. 
this is kind of cool. God panics the end. I love to read those scriptures where, you know, the, 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 the covenant people are totally outnumbered and God panics the enemy. You've been watching a certain impeachment process on TV. You would ask yourself, why on earth would these people put this foolishness on TV? Well, maybe God is confounding them. And when God confounds you, you can't help but act stupid. Threw them into a confusion, a great confounding. But you know what? What they're doing right now in this impeachment stuff on television, that's an indication of what's going to happen to the world when God removes his church. There will be no standard against it. They will just overrun everything. When the rapture comes, that's the indication of the hell that people will have to pay on earth. It's time to get right with Jesus now. Confess your sins, put your face on the floor, turn your heart over to Christ, because that's your only hope here. I know it sounds very counterintuitive in this age of humanism, but you have to lose your life to find your life. So first God throws them into confusion, and then he uh, has weapons of mass destruction <laughs> coming down from the sky. <laughs> they estimate that those were 100-pound hail balls. Now, even if the 100-pound hail ball misses me and hits here, the shrapnel is going to shred me. And their precision... Precision aimed hailstones of mass destruction, for the Bible says they hit the enemy, but they didn't hit Israel. Now remember, they're at the palm of my, they're on the, they're, they're, we're, we're, we're sword fighting here. And God is precision bombing them. And on top of that, can you imagine the confusion? You think you're fighting these guys? And you're, God puts this confounding panic upon you, and then stuff starts falling. You know why God bombed them from the sky? Because they worship the elements. All these nations, they worship the god of war, Mars. We, we, we kind of have that in our language today. We have martial arts. Confounding means he put them into disorder. They were perplexed, disturbed of mind. They were astounded. The historian Josephus writes about this particular event. It's also mentioned in Habakkuk 3.11. Let's go on to the next slide. Joshua tells the Israelites, don't be afraid. He tells the captains, come on, put your foot on the neck of these kings. This is an indication of how the Bible says in, in Ephesians 1.22 that God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things of the church. 1 Corinthians 15.25-27 For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is, he is accepted uh, who put all things in subjection. Jesus Christ and God are not under each other's feet. That's what that's trying to say. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, God, who put all things in subjection under him. There's mutual submission in the Trinity. So God is all in all. Hebrews 2.8, putting everything in subjection under his feet, now, in putting everything in, sub in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But when he wants to exercise that control, he will. Now, why would the Israelites be afraid to approach these kings? Was it A, they were dressed like untouchable royalty? Yeah, yeah. My wife used to say that um, Muammar, Muammar Gaddafi was the best dressed terrorism in the world, terrorist in the world. He wore wonderful outfits. They proudly demanded that commoners not touch them. They were cursing Israel by the gods that they served. 
They demanded, I only want to speak to another king. I'm a king. I'm not talking to you chumps. Where's Joshua? Isn't that how the world tries to intimidate us today? Mm -hmm. I had a former a retired Secret Service agent say to me once, you know, who are they going to believe? Us, we're wearing like $600 suits and we got, you know, $20 haircuts. They have $4,000 and $7,000 suits and they got $200 haircuts and they got makeup artists. Who are you going to believe? Us or one of the politicians or one of the newscasters who are all hanging out in the same places and dressing the same. So, let's move on. So Joshua prays and God makes, not Joshua, God makes the sun and the moon stand still. He arrests time. You know, here's the thing about Joshua's prayer. He prayed to the Lord wasn't Joshua stopping time. I showed, I was at camp a couple of years ago and I was showing a third week of an adult uh, family camp up in uh, New Hampshire, explaining to them that, you know, man-made global warming, you know, we see there's 30,000 scientists now trying to get publicized and say, no, this is not happening. This man is not changing the environment. God is in control of the environment. Everywhere in scripture where you see an environmental change, it's God doing it. It's not man. All right. So he prays to the Lord and his prayer was public. Now, if you did not anticipate that God is going to hear you, would you would you verbalize a prayer that you think God is not going to hear and answer? And what did that prayer do? What did that bold prayer do? It initiated a miracle. You know, you ever say to someone in public, they're telling you about their challenges, and you go, I'm going to pray for you. I know a man who came to Christ. He was in a bank, and someone said that to him, and he's at the corner of a, at a, at a stoplight with all this tension and stress on him. And he goes, wait a minute. She said she would pray to me, pray for me. Who's she going to? God. Maybe God can help me. That was his first time thinking that there was a God who was beyond himself up in heaven who could possibly help him. He said a lady in a, in a, this guy was a worship leader in another, in another church. So the, the, a lady, a little old lady at the, at the booth in the bank said, I'll pray for you. He goes, that was my first realization that, wow, there's a God outside of me who could possibly can help me. But you know what that prayer did? It caused an adjustment to the calendar. All calendars changed in the earth in, in 701 B.C. in response to an adjustment in time. Virtually all ancient calendars initially were based on a 360-day year, 12 months of 30 days each. However, in 701 B.C., apparently in response to this incident that occurred in the constellations that indicated a cosmic adjustment in time, which is termed by astrophysicists as a side reel reckoning. With side reel referring to or meaning or meaning referring to or with respect to the distant stars and the constellations, but not the sun and the planets. Somehow God kept everything spinning while he changed time. They don't know what happened, but all they know now is your sundial is off. So they make a side real adjustment. In the Babylonian system, it was called uh, the system of time reckoning. There's going to be another one, too. I think it's in Isaiah where God has the, the sundial go backwards. They're going to have to make another side real adjustment. Israel adjusted to this by having a really weird calendar. Like every 19 years, they made these 12-day uh, these adjustments every 19 years. The Romans had different adjustments to it. And of course, you know, you have some months that are longer than others because some of the, during some of the adjustments, some of the emperors later said, well, you know what, we're going to make this adjustment and, uh, with the new time system that we have. I'm getting me another day. I'm, I'm Augustus. I'm putting another day in my month. Anyway. In Matthew 20, the Bible was full of these cosmic phenomena. 
Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Ecclesiastes 12, 2. Before the sunlight, moon and stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. Isaiah 13, 10. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened when it rises and the moon will not give its light. Isaiah 24, 23. The moon will be confounded and the sun is shamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. Isaiah 34, I got like 20 verses. I'm not going to go through them all. All you got to do is look up sun and moon. Darkness. By the way, nobody can stop the light. Right? You get up in the morning, like the sun comes through your window, and you're like, you try to hide, put the covers over your head and hide from the light. It's really hard to stop the light. But I want to show you something really cool. There's all kinds of folklore, hieroglyphics, ancient legends, historical records of peoples throughout the world. During Joshua's time, if you were here, the day was long and longer, but if you were here, the night was longer. And historical records, like I said, tribal records, they all know what happened. They just know that they had a really, really like 24 hours of night here, and they had almost 24 hours of daylight here. And these are all the different reports people have compiled from around the world. All right, let's move on. That's why our kids are in South America, right? They're smart. <laughs> now, Joshua chapter 10 is a testament to us that we should rely upon the character and the nature of God. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work in us. The ISV says it this way, now to the one who can do infinitely more than we can ask or think or imagine. The NIV, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power. That is at work within us. The New Living Translation, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Israel had no idea the day they went to that battlefield after marching all night that the day was going to be lengthened for them. Which, by the way, means you've got to stay up even longer. I'm sure that at some point the adrenaline stops, starts flowing and you're like, wow, this is really cool. When they got up, when they started marching that night, they had no idea that hailstones would fall from heaven and defend, and, uh, and defend them. The New Living Translation, now I'll, I did that. The New American Standard, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. The New King James and the KJV are basically the same. Uh, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I could go on and on. Why does this matter? Let's move on. Why does this matter? Because God keeps his commitment to us, regardless of how exhausting is the journey. Our challenge is to trust him and keep on marching. Why? Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see your favorite translation here? If you wait, you renew your strength, you mount up. If you hope, you renew your strength, you soar. If you wait for, you gain new strength, you mount up. If you wait upon the Lord, glorify him, he, 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 you shall renew your strength. But those who wait shall renew their strength. Let's move on. I want to show you something, one more, one more really cool thing. John Wesley lived from 1703 to 1791. And uh, he, he, over in England, he bumped into this guy named George Whitfield, who said, if you're going to say, if we're going to touch the world, if, we're, if the gospel is going to be spread, it can't be spread in churches. And look how he's dressed. These are dignified people. He said, well, I'm not so sure I should be raising my voice and yelling out in public. 
And George Whitfield said, if you don't, fewer people will hear the gospel. George Whitfield comes to America and starts it. Wesley eventually comes too. This is his diary. May 5, preached at St. Anne's, asked not to come back. May 12, preached, the deacon said I could not return. May 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. May 26th, before he went here, I didn't have enough space to put it in here, but May 26th, early in the morning, and the early uh, in the day, he went to preach in a field and a bull ran him out of that field. Probably somebody turned it loose on him. So he goes to the edge of town, and he's kicked off the highway. June 2nd, preaching a pastor, pasture, 10,000 came. You got to keep marching. The conventional wisdom would have said, well, you know, these people, they've been around a long time. They got the, the saint, you know, that church has been around since Rome. Come on, you, if they don't want you, you can't do it. Oh, these deacons are older than you are. He was a young preacher at the time. This is him being escorted out of one of those places. <laughs> He's a short guy in the middle. <laughs> Notice they got him by the arms. You're getting out of here, buddy. Well, you know, the police told me you're not supposed to be doing this. Gosh, the dude can't even go to the edge of town. There must be something wrong with this man. Remember Paul being let down over the wall in a basket? The guy that God was going to use to write two-thirds of the New Testament? You got to keep marching. In closing, let me say this. Is his grace sufficient? I have to look in the mirror every day and see something that sometimes I'm not very pleased with. And I got to say his grace is sufficient because it's not about me. The chief aim of man is to glorify and enjoy him forever. The chief aim of man is not necessarily to live what you might consider your best life now, although you might get that following the Lord. I'm letting go of that. It may happen. That's a side reel. The chief aim of Earl is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. It doesn't matter what these people say. It doesn't matter what those people say. It doesn't matter what they said. It doesn't matter what these people said. It matters that I glorify God with my life. Let's pray. God, please give us your grace to honor our commitments to you. And our commitment is just that you saved us. That's my commitment. You save me. You work in me. You keep me. I'm giving you permission to work in my life in such a way so that you can keep me. I pray that you would make us more sensitive to the call of your Holy Spirit, to the still small voice. Help us to trust you during and after our, our all-nighters. Long nights, God. Father, the Bible tells us that um, 